Chapter 23, Leviathan. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or bore his jaw with a thorn? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportions. His teeth are terrible round about, and when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. He esteem iron as straw, and brass are rotten as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. He laugheth at the shaking off of a spear. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. Job, chapter 51. Or 41. XLI. It's 41. What is Leviathan? He is a fish, reptile, or whale. The mighty monster on whose deck we stood is neither. He belongs to no order of beings ever seen on earth, ever enrolled in ancient mythologies, or conceived in the wildest dreams of imagination. He is a special and distinct creation, akin to no other, yet combining within himself all the more noble and beautiful characteristics seen in the higher orders of the animal kingdom. His graceful and supple body is the exact similitude of man's in, in the chest, shoulders, and loins, and his neck is like that of a horse. His head and beak are shaped like that of a golden eagle. From his shoulders project two great pectoral fins, or paddles shaped like the wings of a frigate bird. His tail, serpentine in form, is terminated by two immense flukes, like those of the fin back whale. His body is encased in flexible curious of jet-black horny scales, fringed with white on their edges. His voice possesses three different qualities of tone. Sometimes he utters musical sounds, sweet as the tones of an Aeolian harp, when in the company with his mate or moving quietly over the waters. At other times, he pours from his vast lungs a deep and ponderous roar, which shakes the sea like thunder, and when enraged or at the approach of great storms, he utters a piercing and terrible scream or cry, which almost seems to split the very heavens. As to dimensions, he is 400 feet long from tip of the beak to the extremity of the tail, his head is 40 feet long from beak to octoput. He is 60 feet broad across the shoulders. His paddles are 70 feet long and 30 feet wide. His tail flukes 50 feet across from tip to tip, and his weight of obtrus, 35,000 tons. As this monarch of the ocean moves over the waves with a presence so majestic and terrible, yet beautiful, he seems like some great mythological deity incarnated in earthly form. The name of Leviathan in the Martian language is Maharaja Buhuvazon, or Supreme King of the Ocean. Captain Samadron conducted us to the quarter deck, which was shaded with awnings. We took refreshments and spent a short time in conversation, having become somewhat accustomed to the novelty of my situation. I accompanied him over this living ship. The officers and seamen numbered about 200 men of three different complexions. The deck was of dark blue metal, about 200 feet long by 40 feet wide, secured upon Leviathan's back with stanchions and great brazen bands surrounding his body. Near the railing were chests of provisions, water casks, and a number of large crystal coffers. Near the center of the deck were several electro-galvanic batteries manned with operators. We sometimes employ electricity to control and guide Leviathan's movements, said the captain. Although he is generally docile and obedient in his mas to his master, yet sometimes his fiery spirits hurries him beyond bounds, and we are compelled to curb him. This is accomplished by the batteries, the wires of which are connected with certain, with certain parts of his body and communicate with his muscles and motor nerves, simulating or repressing them as occasion requires. 
His anatomical and physiological structures are thoroughly understood. We have him under better control than any ship afloat. On some occasions, he plunges to great depths beneath the water during hurricanes or tidal waves. We then take refuge within the coffers, which are transparent, and we can see what is going on around us. In the meantime, Leviathan was rushing over the waters with tremendous speed, far outstripping that of the swiftest ocean steamer. His mighty paddles smote the billows with thundering sound and hurled them back in masses of spray. His enormous tail flukes, sculling from side to side, sweeping the waters up into the great whirling eddies, or spouting masses of foam, literally making the deep to boil like a pot. We now possessed to the foredeck where Leviathan's neck, towering up eighty feet high, was swaying to and fro under the tremendous impetus of his paddles like a giant oak under a gale. It was clothed with an immense mane, the hairs, if hairs they might be called, from forty to sixty feet long, thick as hemp cords, of a reddish-yellow color. As they streamed out in the wind, they resembled a great waving mass of flame. A long rope ladder hung from the top down to the deck. We will now go up and pay our respects to Erizol. Zhang Hartilian, our our renowned Leviathan tamer, said the captain. We ascended the ladder to Leviathan's head, which was covered with great scales, black as ebony and hard as iron. It was encased with a close-fitting framework of steel bands, on a summit of which was a circular metallic platform about 15 feet wide, covering the top of his head like a morion, or skull cap, and was surrounded with a chain railing. Through an opening in the center projected the great horny buckler, shaped like a crest of a Grecian helmet, curving forward and upward over the eyes and backwards over the occupant. It was a black it was black as ebony and smooth as polished marble. We stepped over the railing and stood on the platform, holding to the chains. Sitting astride the crest and mounted on a saddle firmly secured to it was a young man whose magnificent form and prodigious muscular proportions would have awed the Grecian Hercules or giant of Gath. He was over ten feet in stature, his complexion the color of red gold, and his short curling hair a rich Tyrian purple. His large, deep-set eyes, surmounted by heavy black brows, were like glittering steel, piercing as those of the falcon, and had a resolute and commanding expression. His features were cast in a grand and colossal mold like those of a Capolian Jove, but their expression was laughing and jolly as a young Bacchus. He was clad in a flexible suit of shining crystal armor with helmet and gauntlets. From his belt hung an electric wand and a huge mace shaped like a sledgehammer, its solid iron head weighing at least 500 pounds. In his left hand, he grasped a a pair of long steel chains fastened to a great ring perforating the the monster's nostrils, and in his right, he flourished an immense whip like a cat o' nine tails, its long lashes armed with sharp, glittering barbs. Seated on his saddle like a monarch on his throne, whirling his fiery whip, every crack of which threw off showers of electrical sparks, he looked like an Olympian Jove, playing with his thunderbolts. "'Good day, Hartland,' said the captain. "'I have the honor to present you Professor Hamiltonius, a distinguished philosopher from the North Pole.' The Colossus glanced over at me good-humoredly, with his fierce-looking eyes, leaned over and took my hand in his mighty palm with a gentle pressure. "'I am proud to make your acquaintance, sir,' said he, in a deep voice deep and ponderous as the contrabass pipe of great ocean organ. "'You have come from deep climate cold enough to freeze the marrow of an elephant's bones. You must be pretty tough customer, sir.' I hope you enjoy these genial regions where the sun is warm enough to roast eggs. Then bending down, bending down and whispering in my ear, your incognito is pretty good in its way, but I see through it in spite of the spectacles, paint and hair dye. I know all about you, my little professor, but mum's the word, you understand? Laying his finger significantly across his nose. 
Our prince has told me all about how you whipped that twenty-foot shark in a square fight. Splend splendidly done, by Pluto. Artillion looked quite competent to tear any shark to pieces with his bare hands in two minutes, as Samson did the lion. What do you think of my seahorse? he asked, snapping his whip with a crack that would have flayed a rhinoceros alive. He's certainly a tremendous specimen of a breed, I replied. How did you ma manage to catch and tame him? I didn't catch him. I only took him in training after he began to grow up. Have you any seahorses in your ocean? Yes, but they don't much grow much larger than your thumb. Is it possible? The breed must have miserably degenerated. Undoubtedly. Does this frolicsome species of hippocatamus flourish around here? Oh, no, they come from another planet. Which one, pray? From Venus. Venus, great Scott. How did you ever get him here? On board a North Evil boat car. Your car must have been considerably larger than the Treasury Department at Washington. Never have heard of the shop. I can quite appreciate your comparison. Never having heard of your shop, I cannot quite appreciate your comparison. Asterion's ancestor, on one of his trips to Venus, found a nest of little leviathans. They were not big, much bigger than alligators. He caught them in a net, and as good luck would have it, their big papa and mama were off scouring the sea after other monsters at the time. He put them in water tank at the, on board and exercised Ethervolt and brought them over. Several died on the passage, but he managed to save a couple of pair and deposited them in our zoo gardens. They were well taken care of and grew finely, as you see. This fellow is a mere boy, hasn't got his full growth. I've had him in training about three years. He is a clever pupil, obeys me implicitly, and loves me like a faithful, faithful dog, his master. Asterion informs me that there are all sorts of land sea monsters, land and sea monsters on Venus. Yes, that would frighten the devil himself to look at them. Prince Altifor and I propose to take a trip there with Asterion this summer. You must go with us. We'll have splendid sport. Are there any monsters on Mars? Most of them were cleared off ages ago by early Martian races, but near the equator we have sea serpents a few hundred feet long, octopuses with arms long and strong enough to pull out over an ordinary-sized ship. Leviathan and I have had many a tussle with them, but we always lay them out cold, and they generally show great deference for him and keep at a respectful distance. Now and then we meet shoals of sharks or swordfish who are fools enough to show fight, but my seahorse always gives them a sound thrashing. Perhaps we shall meet a gang of them, and you'll see how he lays them out. I should be happy to witness the operation. By the way, Hartilian and I, Hart, by the way, Hartilian, I am informed that you are a Plutonian. I am of that race, and descended from one of the great, one of the seven great monarchs of that lost world. True, but I'm not over proud of it. And a prince in your own right? With naught but a barren title. When was it that the great planet was lost? About 6,000 years ago, according to our annals. That is about the date of the terrestrial man's first appearance on Earth, according to our chronometers, chronologists. Quite a remarkable coincidence, the creation of inhabitants on one world corresponding to the destruction of inhabitants on another. Why was your world destroyed? Because it was accursed for its wickedness, so the theologians say. Because it had grown old and lived out its allotted period, the scientists say. Because it met with an accident, the thoughtless crowd say. Please relate the circumstances connected with the awful catastrophe. Our world was the greatest and most magnificent of all. Our race the mightiest and most highly favored in knowledge, wealth, and power. But as time passed on, we became inflated with pride, love of self in the world, forgot our creator to whom we owed all, became immersed in pleasure, plunged into all manner of excesses, and sank into the depths of sin and corruption. We were often admonished to turn from our evil ways, but scoffed at the rebuke. And although warned of dreadful doom hanging over us, we paid no heed and hurried on from bad to worse, singing and dancing and carousing all over the slumbering volcano beneath us. 
some of my ancestors who had not wholly gone over to Satan and who were familiar with the interplanetary navigation organized a fleet of Ethervolt cars and fled hither. Many were lost on the way. Few survivors who reached this planet were received with great the few survivors who reached this planet were received with great kindness and the hospitality hospitality of them by the Martians and taught them many of our useful arts and sciences. How was your planet destroyed? Some of my ancestors think it was set on fire by the comet comet comma of a comet. Others that one of our moons, which for several hundred years had been gradually drawing nearer in its orbit, at last fell down upon it. Still others affirm that it was blown up by a tremendous explosion. Asterion says that the asteroids are the fragments of it. What was its population at the time? About 600,000 million. The population, however, has been frightfully de decimated by long and destructive wars. Were they, all, were they a tall race like yourself? Much taller, larger, and stronger in every way. Our race has greatly degenerated since we came here. Are there many Plutonians here? But few. There is something in the air and soil of Mars so different from our world, inimical to the proportion, propagation of our race. What it is, we know not. While we owe everything to the kindness and generosity of Marsh, our Martian friends, who succeeded us in our great affliction, and while we love them as members of one happy family of brothers, still we cannot help lamenting the loss of our once glorious world, and we have nothing to look forward to in the future but the final disappearance of our race from the stage of humanity. As Hartilian said these words, a look of deep sadness came over his countenance, and a tear stood in his eye. But I must not yield to these feelings. Then, in cheerful tones, Away with melancholy, I say. Toss dull care to the dogs. While we live, let us live. And in a voice whose, vo and in a voice whose mighty tones rang out over the sea, he burst out into a rollicking song. All at once, to my great astonishment, Leviathan joined in with a soft, sweet musical sound, now rising and swelling and dying away like the tones of an Olean harp. They consisted of a series of rhythmic chords, seeing seeming like an accompaniment to Hartilian's grand song, swelling louder and still louder, pouring forth their deep and sonorous vibrations, like some vast organ swept by a master hand, now majestic and commanding, now joyous and now sad and plaintive. The effect was thrilling, and I have never before knew what power, magic power lay in a few simple chords." as I listened to these wonderful tones uttered by the stupendous monster of the deep. Leviathan is a great lover of music, said, H said Artillian. He has a fine and appreciative ear. It always quiets his turbulent moods, and he is never so happy as when he conveys a gay party with musicians on some pleasure excursion. We will now take a look at his eyes. Artillian dismounted from his saddle, gave the reins and whip in charge of the captain, and taking my hand, we cautiously descended from the platform along the nasal ridge and took a seat astride the beak near the huge nostrils, traversed by a steel ring big as the driving wheel of a locomotive, and to which the reins were fastened. The air rushed through them like the blowing off from the pipes of the steam whist ship. The immense eyes, four feet in diameter and eight feet apart, were overhung by a great black brony brows. The pupils were deep green, the great circles of the Irish iris, golden yellow. Leviathan regarded his master with a pleased expression, then discovering me in me some unaccustomed object, converged his eyes like a pair of convex mirrors directly upon me. It is impossible to describe the sensation that awful gaze produced an overwhelming magnetic fascination, such as ascribed to the serpent on birds, seized me. I trembled, grew faint, and would have fallen had not Hartilian's arm upheld me. He waved his electric wand in front of the eyes. They withdrew their terrible gaze and fixed their look beyond. Leviathan's eyesight is wonderful, said Hartilian. He can detect a friend or foe at almost any distance and his eyes possessed both telescopic and microscopic vision. Would you like to look at his mouth? 
It is a curiosity. I assented. Then we must go inside of it. Is it safe? Perfectly. Then touching Leviathan's mass masterful muscles with his then touching Leviathan's master muscles with his wand. Open your mouth, he said. The monst the monster noiselessly expanded his vast jaws. Hartilian fastened a short rope ladder to the ring. We descended to the lower jaw, clambering over the huge tusks, and stood upon the tongue, an enormous red fleshy mass covered with prickles. Twenty feet over our heads hung the arched roof of the upper jaw, around which projected a row of immense molars, incisors, and fangs, like those of a lion. They were white as ivory, and resembled the stalactites hanging from the roofs of sub subterranean ca caverns. The monster's breath blew over us like a gale of a wind. I looked down the throat, a deep red yawning chasm, large as the opening of a great water main. On either side were the huge tonsils, resembling a pair of great battle shields worn by the medieval warriors, and between them hung the rose-colored pallet, projecting forth like the stump of a ship's bowsprit. We left the mouth and ascended to the forehead. Hartilian resumed his seat and took the whip and reins in his hands. All at once, Leviathan uttered a tremendous snort, like a snarled, startled moose when he perceive, perceives a concealed foe. "'He scents an en enemy,' said the Captain Sam Samaron. "'Good,' said Hartilian. "'We'll have some sport. "'You and he are always ready for a fight. "'Of course, by Pluto. "'Things have been dull enough lately. "'Leviathan hasn't had a square fight for six weeks.' If you discover anything worth notice, let us know. All right, laughed the giant, whirling his whip through the air. Like the whiz of a windmill, the captain and I descended the rope ladder to the deck.